Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, th thanks for having me. My name is Tom. Um, excited to be here. Uh, I'm from 21 Shares. So 21 Shares is uh, one of the largest ETP issuer uh, for crypto. We have a lot of different products and we have currently 1 billion asset under management. And the work I did for the sticking and Ethereum Chappella upgrade is uh, at Dune Dashboard, I worked with Kareem, which is our research associate, and another dashboard on the flip side, which mainly focus on beacon chain data. And I will pass it to another analyst. And pleasure to be with all the starting lineup, like all-star lineup here. So um, here you go. Thanks, Saul. As the other Tom in the chat, I'll go next. So. Uh, Tom Denlevy, former Masari, uh, now on my own, uh, just analyzing and, and continuing to uh, to look at the space here, working with a, a few firms uh, part time. Um, something something coming soon on my end, uh, more full time, so soon TM. But yeah, looking at uh, continuing to look at all of the Ethereum data. I'm more of a commenter and analyzer rather than a uh, in the weeds guy like Tom is. So. Um, a lot of interesting data I think we've seen um, since the beacon changes has, has sort of had these withdrawals. So happy to talk about a lot of the interesting stuff we've seen uh, since then. Sure. Uh, I mean, I I'll go next as, uh, you know, I mean, Tom is an old friend, Tom Dunleavy, that is. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a, a research analyst at Missouri. I've been, uh, you know, sort of covering, staking for, a while now, I was excited about Lido in Q2 of last year and like Rocket Pool Q3 of last year. Now I just uh, mostly go through Hilda B's uh, Dune dashboard, which really just gives like excellent information of like, you know, withdrawals and everything that's happened uh, since uh, since Chappella. So yeah, that's uh, that's my background. Hey, I'll go next. Uh, I'm Oscar, and I work with Nansen in research. And uh, some things I've done relevant to, to this topic is a deep dive into what's going on before the merge, then a piece uh, going on anticipating what will happen with Shanghai. And uh, our team has also uh, published some extensive um, post-Shanghai dashboards as well. Great to be here as well. Hey guys, I'm uh, Riyad Carey, a uh, research analyst at Kaiko Data. Um, we're a crypto market data provider uh, covering over 100 centralized, decentralized exchanges. Um, so looking forward to this conversation. Thanks, uh, Helix, for setting this up. I guess I'm next. Hey, everybody. I'm Elias. I'm co-founder and CEO at uh, Rated. Uh, I've been working in the infrastructure space since about 2020. I've uh, been following the beacon chain since the Medalla testnet. Uh, and at Rated, we are basically building the most uh, complete 360 view of the network. And we deal in what we call machine reputation. Uh, and we're starting from Ethereum validators, and in that context, reputation is performance risk and externalities. So happy to be here, happy to talk about uh, about withdrawals and, and all the cool stuff and events around it. Hey guys, I'm Hill Dobby. I uh, worked at Kaiko a bit before. I also was freelancing a bit for uh, some data on Dune, and then eventually since a year ago, I joined Dragonfly, and I've, I've, I think uh, about a year and a half ago, I thought there was little information, like the all the whole staking ecosystem. So I think the the only thing I could find was uh, Eli Elias's uh, amazing uh, dashboard on like uh, liquid staking, and I think it's great. It's it's like one of the biggest uh, component of it, but I think it's a, I wanted like a bigger picture, so I just built. Um, a dashboard there had a grant from East Acre at the time uh, through quadratic funding. And uh, I just like kind of swore to myself to maintain that dashboard for a while and get it as good as possible given the data I had on hand. And uh, yeah, and I also like got the entire like underlying data 
uh, that I use, I, I, I put it into a spell book so that everyone else can easily leverage it. Awesome. Thanks for those introductions, guys. Um, pretty stacked panel again. Um, also means we don't have a lot of time, and I want to get uh, to everyone's research. Um, I think it's good if we start, because the challenge here is all of y'all did research on different things here. So I think the, the, the best approach to take is if we take just a high-level view and everyone just shares like let's say the, the the top observation that they had and by top observation i mean like the thing that surprised you most or maybe something that confirmed like a very deep belief that you already had about this whole situation um things like that i could start yeah i have a slightly contrarian view around withdrawals and that they're they would be a non-event. And I think the sort of data that, that's rolling through is that it has been a non-event in terms of what's happening with, with staking, right? And, and it, non-event is kind of like a, like a punchy sensational title. What I really mean by that is that, you know, every network you can, that runs on proof of stake, you can stake, but then you can unstake and you can claim your stake back, right? So the Beacon Chain is a little bit special in that it ran for two years and it was, you know, Hotel California, you can, you can check in, but you can sort of never check out until Chapella. Um, and really it's like the network coming into its own and kind of completing the circle and becoming like a fully fledged network in terms of proof of stake where you can stake and then you can, you can unstake. Right. Um, so in that frame of reference, just adding that final piece just makes the network whole. And it's not like a like a like a huge thing, right? Um, the leading indicators up to withdrawals in terms of kind of all the uh, the pegs on on liquid staking derivatives, which you know, if you did see like a massive sort of uh, uh, rush through the exit sentiment, that would materialize in people just selling those derivatives and then these or liquid staking tokens rather, not derivatives. And they would lose the peg. But that happened months before sort of the lead up to withdrawals. And it was not related to that sentiment, right? It was everything was really sort of breaking apart. Uh, and, and the whole industry went through a major credit and, and liquidity crunch, FTX and, 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 and all the likes. Um, and then the pegs were restored. So that was like a pretty strong leading indicator to me. From a performance standpoint, the network struggled a little bit um, as operators sort of upgraded their nodes uh, and all that. We did see kind of the, the highest drop in effectiveness that we've ever seen during an upgrade, um, but then bounced back like within, within days pretty quickly. And in terms of kind of how the flows um, panned out, it was really like a cleansing moment, right? So it, it was really the big entities that kind of uh, uh, withdrew um, were entities that were in some sort of distress. So Kraken, for example, um, was sort of the, the poster boy with all the SEC stuff um, that, that transpired and then they weren't allowed to basically operate the staking operation in the US. So a lot of withdrawals came through Kraken. And then I think it was like the, the other two main ones were... Um, Huobi, which is also, there's, there's a lot of sort of news around Huobi not being in a, in a great state. And then Cream Finance is like, a, you know, the, the project I think was uh, deprecated many, many quarters ago. And then their stake is just, I think, in transition and folding into uh, Manifold's new, new product. And besides that, nothing else. Really, right? And we're, we're currently in a state where the activation queue is like 12 days long and the withdrawal queue is only seven days long, which means that demand for real estate on the beacon chain is actually uh, um, increasing again, right? Effectively having sort of de-risked the whole staking thing, which is the only risk that, that, that existed was, well, if I commit into staking, and then I change my mind or something happens, will I ever actually be able to 
reclaim the money that I've pledged to provide security in the network. And with that out of the picture, um, it's only like up, I think, for staking in the on Ethereum at least, and in, 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 in the leading indicators uh, at least, like a short few weeks after Chappelle are pointing in that direction. Yeah. I think that was a great summary. <laughs> I think, um, you know, up and above the, the detail that was just shared there, the thing that's been most interesting to me is just looking at where um, the the stake subsequent to the event has been going. So you've seen um, a lot of institutional staking providers come on board, which, you know, I think it is that it was the de-risking event. We, we all sort of thought it would be. You've also seen Lido, Rocket Pool, and a lot of the other liquid staking tokens have strong inflows. So the interest is there and the decentralization will continue to sort of play out as these folks get more and more tokens. But that's been the most encouraging sign to me is that uh, where the stake is going and, and who the folks are who are actually uh, redistributing money back into the ecosystem. Right, I totally agree um, what Tom said. Uh, we've seen huge institutional staking providers, right? And afterwards, we've seen highest weekly inflow in terms of deposits uh, on mainnet. And here, I would like to give a huge shout out to Hildavi for his amazing uh, entity stacking, right? If not, we won't have a clear picture on how to map those entities with those addresses. So really amazing work so that we can have full visual on who is depositing, who is withdrawing, right? And in the meantime, I think it's also interesting that um, Elias mentioned a lot of the distressed entities are withdrawing, right? Uh, we have seen that 80% of the full withdrawals are actually coming from centralized exchanges like Kraken, obviously, uh, due to regulatory crackdown. But in the meantime, I think after the FTX and the implosion of centralized entities like BlockFi, Celsius, these entities scared a lot of investors. So liquid staking of these decentralized uh, staking solutions definitely an alternative, a good one for them to hold their own um, staked solutions or uh, staked ETH in their uh, custody wallet. So it's definitely a good sign for decentralized decentralizing uh, uh, the network as well. And in the meantime, I, I find it a really interesting um, findings I would like to share. So one day, right after the Shanghai upgrade, I found that uh, one of the first uh, uh, validators who who withdrew Ethereum, he actually swapped directly on uh, decentralized exchange, swapped the withdrew Ethereum to Rock Apple, and then I tagged him on Twitter and asked, "Oh, why are you you selling your Ethereum?" So he is kind of like the first person I seen on chain selling their Ethereum on decentralized exchanges, and his answer is actually he told me that he's switching from a staking. Uh, a centralized staking solution to a rocket pool. So he's going to operate his own rocket pool node via swapping Ethereum to RPL so that he can uh, use it as collateral. So shuffling uh, is definitely going to be a trend in the future from uh, centralized exchanges towards decentralized uh, staking solutions like rocket pool and Lido. Yeah, and you know this is something that um, like I've been thinking about. Uh, you know, I I always thought that this will be like a big de-risking event, and essentially, I think now staking through liquid staking providers, uh, the risk is near zero. Of course, there's some smart contract risk, and there is some uh, you know like perhaps some counterparty risk, but um, you know liquidity risk is like near zero, like. It's uh, an execution risk on the part of you know the Ethereum developers. That's also gone to zero, right? I mean, uh, we've been fairly lucky, uh, or I mean, the, the work has been great. Uh, the last few upgrades that there haven't been any hiccups at all. So, um, but there was some like execution risk, uh, at least before before Chappella shit. So uh, I do expect that. Uh, Lido, Rocket Pool, and like all the others, like Frax, whoever's doing like liquid staking uh, on like uh, through a decentralized uh, through through a decentralized method will will benefit. But I was a little surprised by uh, how 
slower the growth has been. I know Lido hasn't approved validator, uh, hasn't approved uh, withdrawals yet, but uh, I was still like a little surprised that uh, net inflows for all of these, uh, all of these uh, decentralized liquid staking providers has been fairly low. Uh, and as Tom said, Tom Dunleavy said, um, it's largely the uh, institutional staking providers that have uh, seen, uh, you know, large net inflows. So that was something that was a little surprising for me. Yeah, I, I think. Can... Sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so for me, I, I Shanghai slightly surprised me. I thought there'd be a little bit more selling pressure. Um, interesting, interestingly for me, the principle of stake deep has actually never been higher. Um, at Shanghai, it was nineteen point three. Now it's um, nineteen point one million, but uh, that includes all the re rewards that it had accrued before Shanghai. So. Uh, the principle of ETH has never been uh, higher, and the uh, withdrawal behavior has been uh, very interesting as well. Pretty much 80% uh, of the principal withdrawals um, have been sent to a sex, which would normally imply selling, but um, it's actually the sexes that are uh, withdrawing most of it. Like like Kraken has, uh, has contributed to 30% of all ETH withdrawals, since the upgrade, and then that's followed by Binance and Coinbase, Lido, and Huobi. So this is actually just generally uh, sex is returning the funds to themselves, most of which will actually not be sold. So um, in in total, uh, I think around 250k additional ETH has now hit the market, but most of it hasn't been sold. So uh, I mean, like, I think that's very bullish. We're arguably in a bear market, but a lot of people still believe that Ethereum is the, the only and main game in town. So, uh, yeah, I've been slightly surprised by, uh, I, I don't know, the uh, quite overwhelmingly positive reaction and behavior following Shanghai. Yeah, I think as, as everyone touched on, the, the sort of pretty much a mostly a non event other than uh, central exchanges withdrawing and, and like I think since uh, Chappella, they like if you if you can call it market share, uh, central exchanges like went from like twenty eight percent to now about twenty three percent, and this is by the way looking uh, without the queue. So I'm I'm solely uh, looking at data that is inflows and outflows from the from from mainnet from the weekend chain. Um, so of course the queues play a little role, but it's mostly as like a slight delay to the data that that is applied. So. Nothing really significant, I would say. Uh, but um, yeah, and these these funds are, for the most part, what we're seeing is people are restaking them. And, and actually, the ever since Chappella, the, the like the past four weeks, as it I think has it been four weeks or something, um, they are like the highest in terms of staking uh, almost ever um, in terms of like east staked, uh, which I think is pretty impressive. And it's just a, a showcases that like people have gotten more confident and uh it has been a, a de-risking event where people now know that they can actually withdraw their ETH and, and um just brought more confidence into the to the protocol. Um I'll also be curious to see how uh how Lido um how Lido users react when, when withdrawals are uh, enabled there. Uh, I think that, that is the next thing I'm I'm uh, really curious about. Um but yeah otherwise Pretty smooth, uh, pretty smooth event, and uh, yeah, pretty pretty cool to witness this whole uh, this whole upgrade thing. Uh, you know, I have a um, I, I was looking at this data, and obviously, Kraken, you know, has those SEC uh, has that SEC settlement uh, after which it's not allowed to you know do staking operations in the US. Um, but why is uh, why has there been such like huge outflows from Coinbase and Binance? I haven't really found like a good explanation for myself, why, uh, you know, like Binance is, I mean, I don't think it's the Binance US entity. And uh, I'm not sure why there has been such large amount of staking. Do you think some of it is flowing to uh, in liquid staking protocols or, or, you know, like you have that, um, you, ha you have that chart with like, you know, stakers and profit and losses. Do you think it's something to do with that? Uh, is there a good explanation for why people are withdrawing from 
Coinbase and Binance? I think there's a there's a non-obvious explanation to that. And that's sort of we're all looking at the current best spot view and looking backwards. And there's things like, so, you know, the, the tags um, database, right? Or databases mapping validator IDs to uh, entities that operate them or that the stake belongs to and so on. So at the moment, we are looking at a lot of Coinbase outflows and a lot of Binance outflows because partly all of the, you know, dashboards and work that exists out there indexes on validators that have been identified already as part of Coinbase or as part of Binance and so on. But these large entities have complex deploying structures, right? And the spot view of the database always lacks um, what the actual view is. So, you know, in the last 30 days, I'm looking at, you know, 55% of validators that have onboarded are from entities that have been unidentified. And my bet is that Actually, like a fair amount of those could be Coinbase and, uh, and and potentially Binance, right? Maybe Binance not so much, but definitely Coinbase. So there's on a net basis, uh, Coinbase is like 3% down, but like only from the slice that has been identified. Um, so there's like a, an interesting tidbit to consider there kind of before you, you arrive in in any sort of final conclusion as to whether it's, you know, net down or net up. Yeah, I, I, I agree definitely. Like it's, the data is skewed towards what we've ident identified. So it's easy to point fingers to the bigger, the bigger entities. Um, I think there's several things at play here. Uh, one of the thing is uh, what I'm seeing is most of those withdrawing are from like early, uh, earlier stakers. You can see like the, the validator index indexes are mostly from stakers from back in the 2021 uh, days, and you know, like the, the the space was a little different. Where centralized exchange were probably a much better deal. I don't know uh, if that makes sense in terms of like uh, staking returns or and everything. And and uh, you know, the the longer you've been, maybe those people have been waiting on to to withdraw these uh, this this ETH. Um, there's also uh, a lot of, uh, like you said, new uh, new people staking and staking that are unidentified, which is which is a big problem. And I'm like trying to work through those, but it's uh, most of them can't really be identified. And there's actually there's actually like some validators I, I found I need to to label those that, uh, for example, belong to Coinbase and are withdrawing but aren't tagged anywhere. Uh, you can see like through other stuff. I'll, I'll share this eventually, but. Uh, there's yeah, there's a, there is a lot of central exchange. It's like, of course, what we've identified from what it identified, it is that the central exchange are losing market share towards independent stakers. I think a lot. Hopefully, it's always hard to say whether that is a definitive uh, thing or not because unidentified, you can't really say if it is actually an independent staker. Um, but uh, but it, it is largely a positive uh, thing, I would say. Uh, but yeah, there's there's always this thing where we'll be like lagging in terms of okay, who have we identified and and uh, what does that tell us? So we can really look back, but we can't really say necessarily like what what are these new stakers doing? Who are they? Um, P2P, for example, just recently popped up and like staked a hundred thousand ETH, um, and you know like this is like a recent recent new one technically. Uh, so yeah, it's like always try to be on the lookout. Uh, to identify new entities. There's also possibly an important distinction to make, you know, in terms of uh, how you slice the network, right? There's, you know, the custody layer, which is, I guess, the pools that aggregate capital and then deploy it into operators. And this could be decentralized pools like Lido, for example, or Rocket Pool, or it could be like, I mean, centralized exchanges are pools of capital. They just operate in different ways and a lot of their surface is not on-chain. It's rather, it's rather off-chain, but in, in sort of the, the master highest level archetypical structure, they look very much the same and very similar. And the function that they sort of serve in the ecosystem is actually quite segregated and different from 
someone like P2P, for example, who is a, a place that operates nodes and potentially like runs um, capital for on behalf of others. And in fact, you know, P2P exists in, in the Lido uh, set, might or might not work with centralized exchanges. And so, you know, maybe some of the capital that you see sort of maps back to P2P can also map back to an exchange, right? That they that they work with. So largely these exchanges don't run validators themselves. Uh, some have like staking arms through acquisitions that they did over the last couple of years, or they developed some in-house, but they do operate similarly to um, the, uh, the lighters of the world, right? In terms of distributing the stake to multiple providers, to have redundancy, to have like, you know, appropriate risk management and so on. Cause you know, the last thing that they want is being in, in dire straits because, you know, some sort of mismanagement took place in, 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 in the operation layer, but it's, it's an important distinction to make because the operator doesn't necessarily have in terms of the flows of ETH, doesn't necessarily have the same agency that a pool might have, right? The pool is like much closer to touching the asset, the ETH, rather than the operator who's like, you know, might even be completely abstracted from actually running the capital because, you know, the, the withdrawal deposit keys might sit somewhere else than the operating key. And then, you know, with things like DBT coming down the pipe, this is going to become increasingly more commonplace, right? Segregating sort of the who owns and has access to the capital that powers the proof of stake and the, uh, the operation layer of proof of stake. Shifting gears a bit, I'd be interested to hear the panel's thoughts on where they think the terminal staked rate for Ethereum is. So we're at 15% or so. Obviously, we all know other networks are much, much higher. Do we think it's 30%, 40% or, you know, much higher than that? My own personal view is, you know, 30 to 40% feels right as sort of more stakers come in, the reward structure diminishes and sort of naturally limits um, the need for or the the actual impetus for more stakers to come in. Um, also, you obviously need... Uh, Naked ETH to sort of pay gas prices and, and do other things. So, I guess where does the panel feel sort of that levels off long term, and does it approach any of those those other larger net or those other uh, major networks? I think in the long run, like like there are several pieces of uh, the the staking reward, right? So, first one is definitely the the issuance, which is in the consensus layer. So. Uh, in Dune, I recently saw that data, data always, he shared a really cool calculation, which you can estimate uh, the issuance in the beacon chain based on the number of validators. So check that out. Uh, so right now it's around 3.8% uh, APR. And then you also have uh, the math rewards, right? And the, the priority fees. So in terms of the issuance, uh, if we expect the number of validators will grow in the long run, given that institutional investors are more retail investors are more comfortable with staking due to the de-risking events. So the issuance on the consensus layer um, per validators would definitely decrease. And right now we're looking at uh, the priority fees and math rewards. So in a really long time frame, in my point of view, um, given that we have like Ethereum has a layer two roadmap, right? So a lot of the execution will actually move to layer two. So potentially the priority fees will also decrease so as the math rewards potentially. So in the long run, instead of increasing, uh, I believe it would be uh, more on, on the decreasing side. What do you guys think? Yeah, I just want to uh, uh, cite data always again. Uh, he, he had an excellent uh, report recently where he spoke about the impact of external yield on the, you know, game theoretical fair point in each state. And uh, I mean, his conclusion, I mean, I'm just remembering off the top of my head was that even like a half to 1% increase through things like restaking with Eigenlayer will push out uh, the amount of ETH staked to like close to 100%. Obviously, like, you know, you, you will always need some to transact on the network, but essentially the game theoretical 
uh, number becomes like like tends tends towards 100% and i like i personally do believe that um holding staked versions like liquid staked versions of eth would just become the norm and even more so you know if there is greater adoption of layer 2s because um on layer 2s you can have pretty much any uh any token as the fee token and th- they can just like swap uh you know uh, swap and pay the fees uh on the layer 1 through like eth so i i expect like the number to be very large like in its end state will be um more than 50% uh but like it won't be immediate obviously you know there are like uh, obviously limitations on how much it can grow by and uh this this won't really happen overnight either i have a slightly contradictory and like a point of view where uh, first off i also agree that uh data always that is out the code is really good and and recommend everyone reads it um yeah i think it's a it's a really good new point of view that no one is really looking at much but um i think that a major difference as well with uh, other chain is that just eth is is like useful there's there's stuff to be done with eth and it's not just uh like it, like the, the, this whole assumption of we eventually uh end up with a, like most of it being staked is that um we assume that all there is is eth and a higher yield uh on staked eth but there is actually you know the whole defi ecosystem where there might be better strategies that there's, there's better stuff to be done maybe with eth if if you're good at optimizing it um you know there's there's just a lot more uh that your eth can be used for um and also I'm, i don't know if everyone is comfortable necessarily even if if you can withdraw and stuff you don't have the liquidity necessarily on hand uh, you need to wait for the queue to go through and and, and whatever so it's it's uh i think liquid staking is 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 part of the the solution to this uh illiquidity problem of course but um yeah i i i i it's hard to say for for sure how much uh uh to to estimate the exact amount but i don't think it would necessarily be as high as as we see on other networks actually the hill dummy do you think though that you could have ste or re or whatever just be that base layer of liquidity as it sort of proliferate proliferates into throughout defi rather than just you know regular eth as the base currency i think yeah i think uh, sorry, sorry go just, ahead. just okay. like adding uh, adding a question on top of that like it doesn't have to be like you know there are like risks to the network with too much um like too much being staked through one protocol but it could just be like an aggregator right so we're seeing like uh un- unsheath and uh you know index scoops uh you know these these i think so there are like aggregators as well which which could fill the role which don't really like necessarily have to um have to you know like the, the network isn't like at risk then this uh ties in with a a point that I wanted to bring up um I've really been struck in my recent research with like how prevalent uh liquid staking tokens have become just in defi protocols I mean I think pretty quickly the main uh use case for like lending and borrowing protocols has been um sort of leveraging uh staked tokens uh but the problem with that is that they're super illiquid like especially compared to eth um I tweeted a chart that shows like there's like 100 eth worth of of uh bid depth within 1% of the mid price across all centralized exchanges um which is obviously concerning I mean as, as leverage for these tokens increases like you, you'd ideally like to see that scale up as well uh to avoid sort of large liquidation events which um I think is a is a pretty huge risk right now. I think there's there's like two uh kind of viewpoints on here where um some will try to, to like the 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 ideal utopic thing on on staking is that uh there's a lot of solo stakers and and all are contributing to the network and and securing it in a most decentralized way possible um but there's also those who want to leverage their eth in the best way possible use it in defi and everything and as you said there's like huge liquidity problems uh 
I think like um, most liquid liquid staking assets are are very liquid. Uh, Lido is probably the most liquid and and available through throughout protocols. And in order to get better liquidity, you kind of need maybe some kind of like um, main go to monopoly of uh, liquid staking asset. That would be uh, in terms of liquidity wise. Uh, on chain would be the ideal scenario, um, but then you you know it like counterbalances that other point of trying to be um, spread out across a lot of solo stakers. Um, so I think that's like an interesting dynamic to to kind of look at. I think I think that's the answer. Therein lies the answer in terms of you know what's the terminal staking rate, and it, it largely will depend on what happens with the liquid staking. Uh, markets and all these protocols like if one gets enshrined and is can double for weeth or even eth and you can pay for for fees with it then surely it will tend to 100 percent because you know the opportunity cost would be would be silly probably not 100 percent because you know technical difficulties and all that but very close to 100 percent however i don't know if that's actually like a a plausible scenario, at least with the information that we, we have today. It's a sensible scenario, but there's like a very messy middle until you get to like a sensible scenario from where we are today. And frankly, I don't really see like a very clear path, although the end state makes uh, a lot of sense. So my view is like we end up at uh, like a 50% uh, or, or maybe even lower, 40 to 50% terminal stake rate. And then the rest sort of uh, roams, roams freely. And on the point um, of, of, of solo stakers, um, we sort of run the numbers and, and, and we're going to publish a blog post uh, pretty soon on it. What we found is that uh, solo stakers represent about 7% of the whole uh, stake mass on Ethereum, which is pretty amazing. It's not, like, it, it sounds like a small number, but if you consider that, you know, it's very likely that these people are also like a 30% or more of the actual Beacon nodes that are running the chain, then it, it actually makes for a very strong backbone of the network, right? Like, don't forget Ethereum. The Beacon chain has been designed with, like one of the core design goals of, of the whole thing is to withstand like a World War III catastrophe scenario. And in that scenario where, you know, governments go after kind of all the, the actors that they can go after, well, you, you can't really easily shut down the one honest validator that runs on a fridge um, or, or whatnot. So the, the chain keeps, um, keeps chugging along. Yeah, I'm also curious to hear what people think about, um, like, which, like, what sort of market structure can arise from the LSDs, because, like, Lido is extremely dominant at the moment. It's, like, 30% of all deposited ETH. It's by far the largest um, liquid staking token. And, like, people talk about Rocket Pool a lot, but they're, like, practically incomparable. Like, uh, Lido is just so much larger, and um, yeah, I think with comes that with uh, that comes with some uh, clear governance risk and various other risks like uh, the node operator set maybe not being geographically and legally distributed enough, and what sort of risks that uh, brings. Because um, if like Lido is like the is offering like good yields compared to other things, and um, and it's like a tragedy of the commons like situation where like people will just go with Lido even if it's not necessarily best for the network. So curious what what people think will be an end state in terms of the liquid staking tokens. Um, like, do you think it could be a monopoly or oligopoly, or do you think it could be a a better and more distributed uh, set than that? I think I think there's several things, which is that yes, for, uh, in, in terms of market share, the Rocket Pool and Lido are are not necessarily uh, on the same uh, on the same page. But like 
uh, it, they're also very different protocols. And the, the bottleneck to Rocket Pool is mostly uh, who wants to run run those uh, solo stakers uh, nodes, uh, which now I think is like eight ETH minimum uh, to do that. And it's a much bigger bottleneck than being able to deposit any amount uh, and have it staked by uh, by uh, through Lido. Uh, but I think um, I, I'm I really like it. I think uh, Rocket Pool. I think diversity is cool. But like the, if you look at the at the space and historically in in on Ethereum and, and what has happened, uh, we have a big history of um, starting to rely on on monopolies and, and people getting used to certain protocol becoming the go to standard. Um, you can see this in in almost all sectors of the space and. Um, I hope this isn't the same that is going to happen here, especially since you know it's it's much more important uh, to to have it kind of diversified. And um, Lido does seem hard to like dethrone right now, but um, I don't think it's increasing. Uh, I, I need to. I, I don't. I'm not sure the data there, but uh, um, it's like I'm seeing a, a lot of uh, influx from other stakers as well, other than Lido. And you know we, we're still in this unknown in terms of what will happen when uh, withdrawals happen. Uh, I think it will be mostly a non-event where some will test it out, but you can already swap your STE into ETH if you're if you're uh, if you're um, if you want to unstake. And you know the 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 rates of STE tells us that there isn't actually a lot of demand to unstake uh, this, uh, this, uh, this this STE. But uh, yeah, I I just don't hope we. We reproduce this history of like monopolies that we've had uh, throughout uh, Ethereum's history. Yeah, if I could just add some more color on Rocket Pool with hopefully not going on a Rocket Pool rant as I've been want to do over the past few weeks as I've sort of been bitten by the bug of this protocol. Um, <clears throat> since the Atlas upgrade, they lowered their requirement from 16 uh, ETH to create a mini pool down to eight. The corresponding other side of that transaction um, expands the potential supply of our ETH. So there's been a constraint on the amount of our ETH that can and would be created to date. Now, if you think about each person who creates a mini pool, um, the other side of that transaction creates our ETH. The queue for mini pools right now is sitting at 2,300 people waiting to form a new mini pool. And the constraint is folks looking to actually deposit and mint new RETH. And I think a lot of people have been sort of hesitant to do that transaction because of how high gas fees have been. Um, still, RETH has grown since that upgrade. And I think you're going to continue to see, see it grow as gas fees start to come down. Yeah, I can I can speak a bit to like the liquid staking. I mean, how I think of the liquid staking uh, end game, perhaps. Uh, I do hold, like, you know, RPL, Lido, some of these liquid staking tokens. So just want to give that out as, like, a disclosure first. Um, I uh, I mean, uh, I 100% I agree with Hildobi's, like, uh, you know, like, point about, like, we, like, we've had, like, quite a few monopolies, but I think we've also had a few oligopolies in at least, like, the stable coins, right? So DAI, USDT, USDC, and BUSD, they've all had, like, significant market shares. And I think largely uh, Lido share has been capped around the 31 to 32 percent mark for a year almost so uh, the you know ethereum stakers are obviously cognizant of the fact that if any validator or single entity controls 33 percent of the stake they can sort of choose to single-handedly halt the network and as such um, like I, I don't expect now expect any validator or single entity to ever have more than 33, 33% market share of stake teeth. And I think that just nece then necessitates like at least uh, at least an oligopoly where uh, there are other large players uh, also that are vying for um, you know the remaining 67% of the share. So that could be like one one portion of that could be uh, you know centralized exchanges fighting over some part of the pie and some part will always be solo stakers, you know. Vitalik Buterin himself and, uh, you know, long-term sort of ETH believers who would not use any, uh, you know, sort of the decentralization maxis who wouldn't use any other service. Uh, and I think one, one, another portion could be another liquid staking derivative. Uh, aggregators as well help in this regard where they manage, um, they manage, you know, uh, their allocations to different 
uh, different protocols, so keeping like the risks in mind. So when Lido share exceeds, it, it's not like, you know, exceeds 33%, it doesn't only uh, pose threat to Ethereum, even Lido stakers um, have like a higher risk because they, uh, the, the, like the slashing uh, is much larger if you like the larger your stake is. And I think it's a, if it's about 33%, it's like much more significant. So it's a, like, it's in everyone's interest for like any single entity share to not be more than 33%. And I think it will sort of then necessitate at least in oligopoly, maybe like even higher competition. I have a question for the panel. Um, do folks have good ideas or assumptions as to say now we're at fifteen percent of ETH in circulation is staked, um, and assume that we get to like something like forty or fifty percent? Where does the additional twenty-five to thirty-five percent come from? Who are the people or entities or whatnot that actually will make up for for this balance in the years to come? I would think it would be institutional investors. So right now, um, a lot of areas or countries are still really um, bearish on crypto or not as crypto friendly as some countries like Switzerland. So our company has different crypto products, right? But like US, you still doesn't have a, a spot ETH or spot Bitcoin ETF. But when it happens, it could definitely open up a lot of opportunities for like institutional investors or even retail investors, right? And right now we have seen that um, Hong Kong is like where I'm from, uh, is actually opening up for a lot of like crypto products, right? We have seen that they launch a, a futures uh, Bitcoin and ETH product already. And in the meantime, uh, some Asia countries as well, like they can down the line potentially explore a spot Bitcoin ETF, right? So Asia has seen to be more crypto friendly than the US right now. So uh, I, I believe, in my opinion, the next uh, catalyst for more ETH stake on network could be uh, more institutional uh, crypto products launched in, um, in the world. I think I agree. Any anybody else have any ideas? Yeah, I think I think it's just whoever holds ETH, in my opinion. So I, DAOs, you know, hold some significant parts of ETH. Um, Neosis, I believe, is a big holder. Golem, some of these older ones that had their ICOs. So I think they're quite likely to stake. I know Maker has this end game plan where um, it moves from like ETH to stake ETH. So I just I just imagine that, you know, stake ETH will just be that much more popular that whether it's individual stakers or institutions um, with really minimal risk, uh, it'll be just be um, like the, the standard or the norm to hold stake ETH rather than vanilla naked ETH. Yeah, that's a good point. Um... If, if you if you put all these points like in a time continuum, I would I would wager that sort of institutional capital comes earlier than kind of liquid staking tokens becoming the standard in terms of you know doubling for transaction fees or or whatnot or like you know having even deeper almost protocol level integrations. And so if that is the assumption that we we take as the truth for you know the sake of the experiment, um, then Institutional capital might elect that, you know, the current solutions or Lido, for example, specifically might not can kind of tick their their boxes in terms of um, the risk that they're willing to uh, to undertake. Right. And that's in the short term, one sort of um, interesting path forward insofar as, you know, how this ecosystem will will pan out in terms of distribution. So other products that actually like cater to that kind of capital that we assume will be interested um, will we'll, we'll take like a disproportionate amount of these new flows into, uh, into staking. Interesting. Do you think these are products already in existence or that still need to be developed? 
Um, I think I think there's like a lot of interesting products that are coming to market right now. So um, Alluvial is one, Etherfy is another one, Swell is another, Stator uh, is another. They all kind of cater to different um, use cases. I would think that Etherfy and, and Alluvial Liquid Collective are kind of the ones that are architected in a way that is more amicable to the sort of demands and needs of more institutional uh, like capital. We have like a lot of new products that are coming online in terms of, uh, of, of liquid staking. Um, I think by the end of this quarter, there's going to be more than 10 different protocols that are deployed on, uh, on, on Ethereum. So there's enough design sort of variability in, in the environment already. So I don't think it's really new products. It then becomes a game of business development, <laughs> as unsexy as that, as that might sound. It's like, okay, well, you know, this capital won't necessarily come of its own accord. It needs to be sold into the, uh, the opportunity. So there's this sort of, you know, unsexy uh, uh, work that people will do and then you know whoever whoever does it best um really might have the better chance so obviously like uh, side by side with a with a great product that sort of caters to whatever the need one sets of these these entities might be uh and i guess i guess we'll see right build it and they will come is not always true unfortunately you also need that extra piece of the puzzle um and you do yeah, you do need both sides um so that's an interesting takeaway. I think that, you know, starting uh, th this talk and everybody agreed, it has turned out a bit of a non-event. Uh, if anything, it makes the network whole. Uh, it has been bullish on uh, decentralization, not so good for some institutional players such as Kraken. Um, yeah. Uh, but according to you, there will be very interesting developments going forward to see who will cater to these institutional players who will become bullish on um, on Ether, especially uh, especially after uh, Shanghai update and the whole de-risking. Um, I do want to be mindful of everyone's time here. Um, we're coming up at the top of the hour and everyone in the audience, I want to thank you for being here. Thank you for listening in. Um, it's been wonderful. Uh, it's been amazing to just see you guys, uh, listen to you guys talk, exchange thoughts, asking each other questions. I, I feel like this is the way every panel should be, you know, uh, mutual engagement and interest from everyone. Um, so Guys, please give everyone on the panel a follow. Uh, you can always expect top insights from them, top information. Um, so, yeah, just give them a follow. also want to give everyone an opportunity to, to just outro and tell everyone in the audience what you're working on currently, where to find you, um, newsletters, websites, etc. Yeah, I appreciate you having us on. Um, nothing to plug yet, as I mentioned. Uh, more announcements coming on the personal side, uh, hopefully soon, on where I'm uh, where I'm going to be stationed full time. But uh, yeah, you can always find me on Twitter at dunleyv 89 And just another shout out to Hill Dobby for all of the amazing work. I think we're all jumping on his back with a lot of the stuff. Uh, he, he basically holds up Dune in my uh, in my view in data ways. So, thanks. Um. Thank you for having me, and I learned a lot uh, from everyone in the panel as well. Uh, super happy, and right now I'm working on a new Dune dashboard, which is about Ethereum, so stay tuned. And in the meantime, we also have a lot of newsletter, uh, a lot of great content, great tools, which is available on our website, 21 Chess, and then look up our research there, and stay tuned. Yeah, thanks for uh, hosting this, uh, Helix. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, 
at Keiko, we've got a couple newsletters, one uh, more like broad market trends, and then a deep dive one. Uh, you can find that at our uh, new research website that's linked in my bio. And yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so great to be here. Thanks for having me. I uh, really enjoyed hearing all the insights from uh, such a brilliant panel. And yeah, I'm, I'm currently working with Nansen Research uh, covering uh, scaling and infrastructure. And uh, yeah, so check out Nansen Research for some nice data-driven research. Um, yep, yeah, thanks for having me on uh, Helix and Metric Style. It was such a great panel. I, I just had like my notebook out, and you know everyone's such a such an expert in their field. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, and uh, you know Misari Crypto as well. Um, I will continue to write research and cover staking and all things you know DeFi and layer ones. Um, yeah, thank you. Super. Thanks, Helix, and everybody for putting this on and, and, and sharing your, your viewpoint points. Um, you'll find us under rated.network or at rated W3B on, on Twitter. I'm at Eliasimos on Twitter. Uh, and if you're interested in working with infrastructure data, especially low level funky stuff like, you know, MDB and building things like relay reputation, build a reputation, dig deep into that whole can of worms that is infrastructure data, come talk to me. Uh, we're always looking for great people to work with. Thank you for uh, hosting Helix. That was, uh, that was really nice, really good talk and, uh, and uh, learned a lot there. Um, uh, you can find me on Dune uh, and on Twitter. And yeah, I think I, I also use just about tools from everyone here. So uh, it's also nice to have a, to have a really good uh, uh, panel um, in general for staking, I, I would just recommend if you if you look at high level data, there's a lot of dashboards. If you look at low, lower level data, I would recommend, like Elias said, uh, a rated dot network, which I think has the best view there. Um, and in terms of what I'm working on next, uh, uh, Dune dashboards mostly. And <laughs> in terms of uh, what exactly. There's, yeah, there's a lot of them. I, I can't really say right now because I don't know what we'll, uh, I'll be able to share next. But uh, yeah, thanks a lot for hosting. Amazing. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you to the audience for being here, listening in. Uh, if you want to check out more of this contact, content, give us a follow. We'll have these uh, spaces weekly. So those are always cool to check out. We have educational courses if you want to learn Web3 data analytics. Uh, so give us a follow, check us out, and see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, guys.